Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Cincinnati Art Museum. I am Amy Dehan. I'm the curator of decorative arts and design here and the curator of the exhibition Upstairs, Unlocking an Art Deco Bedroom by Joseph Urban. Um, so I hope that you have had a chance. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope you've had a chance to see it. Um, since you're clapping, I'm really hoping you've had a chance to see it. Um, this glamorous late 1920s Art Deco bedroom at the heart of the exhibition is, I feel safe to assume, unlike any of the rooms that we had as teenagers. <laughs> um, but Elaine warms her. She was an only child. She was 17 when her family approached Joseph Urban to design um, this masterwork bespoke bedroom. Um, in the process of researching this room and unlocking its stories, I was very fortunate to come across the work of our speaker, Dr. Jason Reed. Um, as a historian, uh, Jason specializes in cultural and social history, the history of education, and the history of childhood and youth. He holds a PhD in history from York University in Toronto and currently teaches at Ryerson University, also in Toronto. In 2017, he published his doctoral research in the engaging and expertly written book, Get Out of My Room, The History <laughs> of Teenage Bedrooms in America from 1800 to, 18, or to 1995, right? Okay. So I, I was so pleased that he accepted this invitation to come and be with us this evening and speak and really put the Wormser bedroom upstairs in the context of this fascinating history. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jason Reed. Good evening. Um, let me just say that I'm very happy to be here. Um, as I've been telling the employees here the uh, past 20 minutes, I uh, had a bit of an in-flight emergency coming in here uh, yesterday. Yeah. Um, there was talk of engine failure, instrument failure, had to go back to Dulles, ambulances, fire trucks on the runway. So when I say I'm, hap when I say I'm happy to be here, I'm happy to be here, so. Oh, is that better? There we go, okay. So uh, let me begin, first of all, by thanking the museum for inviting me down here uh, to share my research with you. Um, and special thanks should go to Amy DeHan and Emily Holtrup, hope I'm pronouncing their names right, uh, both of whom did a fantastic job getting me down here, so. Um, before I start talking about Elaine Wormser's bedroom and explain how it fits into the larger context of teen bedroom culture, I need to set aside some time to address two issues. Firstly, I need to provide everyone with a definition of teen bedroom culture. <laughs> there we go. So while doing research for my book, I always struggle to explain to both academics and non-academics why my research uh, actually uh, deserved any amount of attention. And I'll be honest, I quite often got laughed at whenever I told someone that I'm doing research on teen, teen bedrooms. And this is mainly, not primarily, but mainly because teen bedroom culture isn't exactly a well-known concept among the general population, even though a majority of Canadians and Americans born after the Second World War, which is, I assume most of you here are, uh, most certainly had first-hand experience contributing to teen bedroom culture. You're all part, if you had a, a room of your own growing up, and a lot of you probably did, you took part in teen bedroom culture. So the best way to understand what I mean whenever I use the term teen bedroom culture is to understand that the teen bedroom it itself isn't just a space where teenagers sleep, hang out, and do homework. This space is loaded with meaning and is shaped by powerful social, cultural, and economic trends, including ideas about consumption, child-rearing philosophies, architecture, technology, sexuality, et cetera, et cetera. It's a site of huge cultural significance that plays an outsized role in the lives of many teens. I would say most teens, actually. 
The simplest way to describe it is to note that without teen bedroom culture, the Wormser exhibit upstairs probably wouldn't exist, or at the very least it would look very different. If you were to tell someone 200 years ago that an art gallery in Cincinnati was going to create an exhibit devoted to the bedroom of a relatively unknown teenage girl, you'd end up confusing a lot of people. And this is because bedrooms for teenagers wouldn't have been considered unique back then. They wouldn't have been treated much differently from bedrooms that were geared towards parents or younger children. And to be honest, 200 years ago, the word teenager didn't even exist. The concept didn't exist. You were either a child or an adult, and that was pretty much it. Teen bedroom culture wasn't a thing back then because the necessary preconditions didn't really exist for most American families to engage in this custom, which leads to the second issue I need to address before we move on to the Wormser bedroom. This is the history of teen bedroom culture. When, where, how, and why it took shape. Unlike, say, the start of the Civil War, there's no firm date we can point to for the creation of teen bedroom culture. It's not something that newspapers kept tabs on, but rather something that grew organically and developed over time. Nonetheless, I think we can give a, a ballpark figure for its development, and I would put, put its emergence during the early eight, 19th century, pardon me, like the 1820s, 1830s. This is right when America was transitioning away from a largely rural and agrarian society towards an urban and industrial society. And this distinction is important because teen bedroom culture is very much a product of modern forces, of industrialization, urbanization, and its variant suburbanization, consumerism, and the rise of the middle classes as the most dominant group in US society. And some teenagers, teenagers certainly had rooms of their own, say in the 18th century before this period, before the modern era kicked off, but they were definitely the exception rather than rule. So I'm going to emphasize six, six major factors that helped bring the separate bedroom ideal and teed bedroom culture to life in the years leading up to the creation of Elaine Wormser's bedroom. And the first trend that needs to be discussed is the growing wealth and affluence of American society. Children during the colonial era and the early republic, uh, any time before basically the war, the war of 1812, often shared bedrooms and beds and bedrooms not only with their siblings, but in many cases with their parents, members of the extended family, and sometimes complete strangers, for example, boarders. The average household was small and overcrowded. John Goff, a British-born temperance advocate who came to America as a 10-year-old, recalled sharing a bed with a gravely ill man after moving into a New York City boarding house in 1831. To my surprise, he recalled in his autobiography, I found when the hour of rest approached that I was to share a bed with an Irishman who was lying very sick of a fever and ague. And ague is the chills you get when you have diseases like malaria. <clears throat> Famed novelist Upton Sinclair recalled sharing a bedroom with his parents in Baltimore during the 1870s and 1880s. Quote, we never had but one room at a time, and I slept on a sofa or crossways at the foot of my parents' bed, end quote. In other words, privacy for many Americans during the 19th century was a luxury reserved for the few. If you didn't have money, chances are you didn't have the means to provide your children with rooms of their own. The exponential growth in wealth that came about due to industrialization, however, created greater opportunities for privacy within the home. As the 19th century progressed and the US became a major economic power, privacy was no longer reserved for the super wealthy. It was now within the grasp of middle class families and even some uh, working class families as well. Now the second factor that we need to wrap our heads around in order to explain the emergence of teen bedroom culture is demographic change. Now average family size in particular, began to shrink during the early 19th century and intensified after the Civil War. In 1800, for example, the average American woman could expect to give birth to seven children in her lifetime. This is 1800. By 1900, that number had dropped to 3.6 children. In the span of 100 years then, the birth rate was essentially cut in half and families became, on average, much smaller. At the same time, extended family arrangements, and this means households that are shared by parents, 
children, grandparents, aunts, uncles, the extended family, were being replaced by the nuclear family, and this is households that are uh, limited to parents and children, so two generations in one house. This trend, in combination with the decline of live-in servants and families who took in borders to make ends meet, resulted in less crowded homes for many Americans, which in turn aided the development of teen bedroom culture. After all, the decision to provide teenagers with rooms of their own was often a matter of simple arithmetic. Suffice to say that a family of four or five was much more capable of providing their children with separate bedrooms than a family of eight or nine. In other words, size mattered. Teen bedroom culture couldn't have come about without its cheerleaders, without the support of prominent groups and individuals who believed that giving teenagers rooms of their own was a good thing. During the early to, to mid-19th century, this role was filled largely by religious figures, many of whom offered what I would call sacred expertise. And as it turns out, evangelical Christianity, which also began to take off in popularity during the 1820s and 1830s, was an integral part of early teen bedroom culture. This was because many mi middle-class evangelicals believed that giving teenagers rooms of their own would encourage young folks to pray, read scripture, and wrestle with pressing theological issues. <laughs> it's, it's true. The teen bedroom, in other words, so the, the thinking went, would help teens forge a one-to-one -one relationship with God. And this is, this is the, the strange part, the bedroom conversion experience, whereby an, an individual finds God in the privacy of his or her, her own bedroom, became a prominent trope in 19th century evangelical liter, literature. If you go through some of these uh, memoirs from the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, there's tons of stories about uh, young children, even grown adults, finding God in their, in their own bedroom. It was a, just a, a, a strange uh, phenomenon, but it happened. So, Consider, for example, the conversion experience of Elizabeth Payson, a young girl from Portland, Maine, who would eventually go on to become a popular novel, novelist and hymn writer. Born in 1818, Elizabeth was the daughter of Edward Payson, an eminent pastor. As Payson's memoirs make clear, the young girl wrestled with a lot of religion-inspired despair throughout much of her childhood oftentimes expressing confusion as to whether God loved her, whether she loved God, and whether she would ever get into heaven. In February 1834, however, and this is when she'd be about 16, 17 years old, after years of pondering her spirituality and accepting religious counseling from a local minister, Elizabeth had a conversion experience in her bedroom, one that would change her life forever. Quote, I knelt down to pray, she wrote, and all the wasted, childish, wicked life came and stared me in the face. I looked at it and said with tears of joy, but he loves me. He being, of course, God. So bedroom, Payson's bedroom in this instance acted as something more than a mere sleeping space. It had become a powerful conduit through which at least one middle class girl could finally grasp the power and scope of God's love. This probably seems a bit odd to us now, but this was a common experience apparently. Other religious denominations also recognized the teen bedroom's religious value in due time, but it's telling that some of the earliest supporters of giving teenagers rooms of their own were religious figures with an evangelical bent. As influential as it was, however, religious expertise would eventually be supplanted by a more powerful form of expertise, which leads to my next point. The fourth factor in helping to explain the emergence of teen bedroom culture is the rise of secular forms of expertise, most notably child psychology texts and child rearing literature with a social scientific rather than a religious bent. As disciplines, child psychology and child development emerged in the 1880s and 1890s. Many of the academics and therapists who worked in these fields consistently rallied around the idea that the privacy associated with a room of one's own was beneficial to the development of America's, America's teens, arguing that it helped teens develop a strong sense of self, cultivate respect for personal belongings and property ownership, keep teens in the home and out of trouble, which a huge thing, early 20th century, contribute to their cognitive growth and further their educational pursuits. 
At times, secular experts resorted to fear-mongering to make their point, oftentimes arguing that denying te teenagers rooms of their own could lead to pathology and mental illness. Seriously. Smiley and Margaret Blanton, two Freudian psychoanalysis analysts, pardon me, argued in the 1920s that shared bedrooms were, quote, invitations to incest, end quote, a means of encouraging sex acts between siblings. Other child development experts, meanwhile, argued that shared bedrooms hampered personal autonomy, which could in turn cause male children to develop into mama's boys, and that's a phrase that gets thrown, thrown around often, and cause female children to become sexually promiscuous once they entered into puberty. And in other words, many of these experts seem to suggest that the uh, private teen bedroom could help prevent the creation of a generation of wimps and tramps. <laughs> yeah. Long story short, child psychologists and child development experts believe that the teen bedroom was a necessary feature of the transition from dependent child to independent adult. There's no longer just a luxury item. Every teenager should get a, a room of their own in order to, to develop properly. And this idea, which I, I would add is still popular today, in fact, it's been extended to even younger children, uh, this idea would eventually become normative due to the efforts of popular child-rearing experts in magazines and newspapers all across the country. So it wasn't just Freudians and social scientists making this argument. It would eventually be picked up by people like Abigail Van Buren, uh, Dr. Spock, more, people that had a, a, a greater audience than any of these uh, therapists and academics could dream of. So whereas child-rearing expertise were focused on the teen bedroom's role in shaping its occupant's souls or sense of self, the business community em emphasized the, con the consumer desires of teens above all else. By the late 19th century, the teen bedroom was a space that needed to be decorated, a repository for all sorts of personal belongings and knickknacks, an educational space, a social center, and a technology hub. This space needed to be equipped with all sorts of small and big ticket items, be they desks, vanities, beds, framed photos, shelving, radios, phonographs, etc. And of course, furniture manufacturers, home electronics companies, and other business interests, with some assistance from home decor experts in newspapers and popular magazines, were more than happy to indulge teen whims. Indeed, design experts deserve special attention here because they often acted as mediators between parents and teens who had the money to spend on non-essential consumer goods and the various business interests who were eager to bring their products to a wider audience. And I would actually argue that the teen bedroom became one of the earliest sites of teen consumption in the early 20th century, a means of introducing teens to the joys of consuming. Because all, most of the other forms of teen consumption were forbidden back then. That would be going to movies, going to pool halls, juke joints, and stuff like that. So parents were very happy to have them uh, direct their consumer energies towards something that took place in the home rather than somewhere unsupervised. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, many experts and gatekeepers use child development theories to encourage bedroom-oriented consumption among teens. A properly decorated and appointed bedroom, many experts argued, would encourage independence, individualism, self-expression, and other character traits that were prized by child-rearing experts. For instance, in 1930, just as Elaine Wormser's bedroom was nearing completion, one decor expert claimed that a properly decorated teen bedroom could, quote, enhance the individual, individu pardon me, individuality of the owner and facilitate the expression of his own tastes and needs and activities while affording him free opportunity for his own pursuits without disturbance and without disturbing others. It wasn't enough to merely provide teenagers with rooms of their own. Peer parents needed to make sure that these rooms were well fur furnished and brimming with scores of consumer goods that reflected the tastes of their owners. Proper development, in short, was dependent on purchasing a wide range of goods and services. Lastly, we can't underestimate the ways in which technological change has contributed to the development of teen bedroom culture. For starters, technological innovation opened up additional space within the home by allowing rooms that had once been used for storage to be reconfigured for other functions, including providing separate bedrooms for pri privacy-starved teens. And the best example of this is the basement, 
a dark and musty space that was most often used during the 18th and 19th centuries for storing foodstuffs and fuel. The development of refrigeration technology and oil furnaces, to take just two examples, changed all that by minimizing the basement's food storage function and by doing away with the coal bins and firewood piles that ate up space in many a 19th century cellar. It could be argued, in fact, that any teenager who was lucky enough to preside over a basement bedroom during the, pardon me, during the 20th century wouldn't have been so lucky had they been born 100 or 150 years earlier. 19th century families couldn't have dreamed of having a bedroom in their cellars if only because that space needed to be filled with the necessities of life. Again, food and fuel. And this goes back to my earlier point about how during, about how during earlier areas of American history, uh, space was a luxury that most people simply couldn't afford. It's also worth noting that some of the most important technical, technological advances of the late 19th and early 20th centuries had a decentralizing effect on the home, oftentimes creating an approach to family living that emphasized solitude over togetherness. Consider, for instance, the emergence of central heating in the late 19th century. Whereas earlier generations had to huddle around a centrally located fireplace or wood stove to keep from freezing to death, middle-class families during the late 19th and early 20th centuries found that they were no longer obliged to spend the bulk of their time in one or two central rooms in order to take advantage of basic amenities. Because central heating piped warm air into every single room, the entire house was opened up to a wider range of activities. Children and parents could slink away to their rooms and entertain themselves without worrying about coming down with a case of hypothermia. As an architecture expert from the New York Times explained in an article celebrating the effects of central heating, quote, instead of huddling around an open hearth, keeping doors tightly shut between rooms, or even going to bed with a nightcap, people reveled in a newfound freedom. Even in the depths of winter, they are able to move around their houses without shivering, end quote. So think about how the development of central heating would have affected something as simple as sharing a bed with someone. Now, sharing a bed in the days before central heating wasn't necessarily a sign of family togetherness. It was a practical means of keeping warm during the colder months by sharing body heat. Central heating changed all that by making it possible for family members to sleep alone during even the coldest stretches of winter. And this is something we take for granted nowadays, but it represented a huge change in how families lived and interacted with each other. Together was no longer a necessity for many, it was a choice. Another very important type of technology, home electronics items such as radios and phonographs, also had a splintering effect on the home and ideas on family togetherness. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, radios and phonographs were huge, expensive pieces of furniture that were often placed in communal parts of the home, most notably the parlor or the living room. So here we have a phonograph from 1904. And you'll note that it is basically the same size as the woman who's standing beside it. Right? It's a massive piece of furniture. that It can't just go anywhere. It's probably in the parlor. And to the right there, you see a radio from about 1930. And it's, it seems a bit sleeker and smaller than that one, but it's still a pretty substantial piece of furniture. And you notice, too, that that seems to be in a parlor or living room, and the entire family's huddled around it, probably around like Roosevelt's fireside chats or something like that. So, <clears throat> Out of necessity, l listening to the radio or, or a phonograph back then was often a family activity. However, as time wore on, these items became smaller and less expensive, and they began to migrate more and more into the bedrooms of teenagers. Listening to the radio was no longer a communal activity, it was something that could be enjoyed in solitude. This was more so true in the years after the Second World War, but I would point out that the trend towards smaller, inexpensive home electronics items began to take shape in Elaine Wormser's day, like the 1920s and 1930s. I tried to find some uh, pictures of some of the more compact machines from the 30s, and I couldn't find a good one that would show up well on screen, but they basically looked like a, like a, a PlayStation 4, about that size. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely smaller than those, anyway. <clears throat> so how does Elaine Worms' bedroom, pictured here, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming most of you have probably seen it upstairs, how does Elaine Wormser's bedroom fit into the sketch I've just drawn for everyone? 
Was her bedroom representative of what was going on in teen bedroom culture in other parts of the country and among teens who were more or less privileged than her? With some exceptions, I would say that the answer is yes. They're big exceptions, but I'm going to say yes. So I'll begin by addressing the role of wealth in bringing about, bringing the Wormser bedroom to life. Now, obviously, the Wormsers were an extremely wealthy family. Elaine's father was a powerful lawyer in Chicago, and her mother came from a wealthy family from right here in Cincinnati. Uh, the Wormsers were most certainly members of the so-called 1%, which means that aspects of teen bedroom cultures that may have been denied to poorer families were read readily available to them. As far as I know, money was never an issue for the Wormsers. Strangely enough, the fact that the Wormsers lived in an apartment makes them some, somewhat of an outlier in teen bedroom culture. And this is because teenagers who lived in detached or semi-detached homes were much more likely to have rooms of their own, as these types of houses offered more space and privacy than an apartment. However, the Wormsers weren't living in just any apartment. They were living in a penthouse suite in one of the most prestigious luxury apartment buildings in Chicago. Blueprints of their home, and I was going to put up an image of the blueprints of their house, but it was just too massive and too confusing to make any sense up on the screen. But blueprints of their home revealed that the Wormser's apartment had four main bedrooms and three servants' quarters for a total of seven rooms that theoretically could have been used for sleeping. In other words, the, the Wormsers had a ton of space and privacy at their disposal. It's also worth mentioning the timing here, the timing uh, in terms of the building of this uh, bedroom. Uh, the design and construction of Elaine's bedroom was begun in 1929 and ended in 1930, just as the world economy was sinking into the Great Depression. For many families, the Depression led to great misery and, as it turns out, a return to crowded living conditions. Fortunately, I can't speak definitively about how the Depression affected the Wormser's finances, but I suspect that their great wealth probably sheltered the family from some of the Depression's worst outcomes. After all, they could still afford to hire Joseph Urban to design her bedroom and send Elaine off to college a few years later, right when the, de the Depression was starting to wreak serious havoc on many American families. Next up is how demogra demographics shaped the Wormser bedroom. It's important to remember that, as Amy mentioned earlier, that Elaine Wormser was an only child. As a result, there is no competition for space in the Wormser household. There is no doubling up with siblings or parents. However, even if Elaine did have siblings, her, father, her family's great wealth would have had more than compensated for this. Again, their penthouse apartment was quite spacious, which means that the Wormser probably could have had several children and still had the space to give them all rooms of their own. Now, I mentioned two forms of expertise earlier in this lecture, child-rearing expertise and then consumer-oriented expertise, for instance, home decor advice. Now, obviously, decor, decor expertise played a significant role in Elaine's bedroom as the Worms was hired Joseph Urban, one of the most famous architects slash designers in the entire country, to both design and construct their daughter's bedroom. Here's a photo of Joseph Urban from around 1920. However, Urban's involvement was somewhat unusual, if only because the expertise employed here was much more direct, immediate, and expensive. Elaine's room wasn't simply the product of advice found in an, in an issue of Ladies Home Journal. It was a bespoke bedroom, a custom-built space, in which the occupant of the room actually knew and interacted with the person responsible for designing it. And this is like hiring Jimi Hendrix to come over to your house and give, your, give you one-on-one -on -one guitar lessons while your friend down the street is stuck using a how-to manual on how to do a D chord. <laughs> Elaine Wormser's bedroom, in short, was shaped by a type of expertise that most teens could only have dreamed of. It's also worth mentioning the ways in which Urban's experience was influenced by parental concerns, as Elaine's parents had the authority to approve or deny many features of their daughter's bedroom. Nowadays, of course, these types of parental intrusions are considered bad form. Um, yeah. Teens are given as much leeway as possible to direct, decorate their rooms as they see fit, with some limitations, of course. 
Nonetheless, direct parental oversight over room design wasn't actually that unusual back in the 1920s and 1930s. A cooperative approach, whereby the needs and parents were held in somewhat equal regard, was fairly popular during the interwar years. In fact, the, the teen-centric teen approach we're familiar with nowadays wouldn't really fully emerge until after the Second World War, like the 1950s and 1960s uh, in particular. Nonetheless, I would argue that the sheer amount of money required to create Elaine's bedroom ensured that her parents would have ended up maintaining a certain amount of oversight over its construction anyway. Suffice to say that parents are more likely to have a vested interest in a bedroom that costs several thousand dollars to design than a bedroom that features like some secondhand furniture and some pinups on the wall. I suspect that Elaine's parents and, and maybe even Elaine herself um, played an outsized role here because it was costing them a pretty penny to bring it to fruition, the equivalent of 117,000 current dollars. Also, I, I tend to think that they were concerned about the resale value of their penthouse suite as well. Um, I'm speculating here, but I, I suspect that Elaine's parents didn't want Urban to design a monstrously ugly bedroom that might scare off future buyers. They wanted to be right in there on the ground floor. The next point that needs to be addressed involves consumer trends or consumerism. And of course, this is very much tied in with wealth as affluent families were more likely to be uh, avid consumers than uh, working class families. Poorer Americans couldn't afford to engage in acts of conspicuous consumption because most of their income was geared towards the basics, towards food, rent, etc. The Wormsers, by contrast, had the income to be voracious consumers if they wanted to. And this is reflected by the fact that they were able to hire Joseph Urban, again, one of the biggest designers and architects in the world, to, de to design such an opulent bedroom. The bespoke furniture, drapes, and carpeting suggests that this is conspicuous consumption at its most intense. Again, during a time when the world economy was sinking into the sewer. So, um, Nonetheless, I'm more impressed by some of the smaller consumer items that managed to find their way into Elaine's bedroom. And here are two examples of them. Her bedroom may have featured some of the most expensive furnishings and accessories on the market, but it was also housed an assortment of knickknacks and collectibles, including ceramic dog figurines, perfumes, and books. I have no clue how, how, how much these items cost, but this part of the Wormser bedroom is a reminder that Elaine, despite having all this money at her disposal, was not all that different from some of her less affluent peers. Her bedroom was also littered with personal items and collectibles. So what's missing from the Wormser bedroom? What parts of Elaine's room don't necessarily align with the sketch of teen bedroom culture I discussed earlier? Fortunately, I don't have much information regarding the Wormser's view on modern child rearing techniques. And here's a lovely photo of the entire family from 1926. Due to his emphasis on individual, individuality, autonomy, and self-expression, one could argue that Joseph Urban was influenced either directly or indirectly by modern ideas on child development, but it's hard to make any definitive claims about Elaine's parents. We simply don't know the extent to which either religious or social scientific views on child rearing inform their decision to give their daughter a room of their own. It should be noted, however, that the Wormsers were prime candidates to have at least a basic familiarity with some of the child development theories that were weaving their way through American society during the 1920s and 1930s. For instance, they were educated, they were affluent, and they lived in a large and diverse, diverse urban center where new ideas and theories flowed like wine, and many of which, I should point out, were hatched at the University of Chicago, one of the biggest hubs of social scientific thinking in the entire world at that time. The Wormsers, in short, were in the right environment to take in social scientific views on child rearing, and they were the type of people who would have been most interested in consuming this type of cutting edge child rearing advice. More, moreover, it's important to re remember that the Wormsers were Jewish. Given what we now know about how Jewish intellectual culture shaped the development of both Freudian psychoanalysis and psychiatry as a whole, it wouldn't be surprising to find out that the Wormsers were familiar with the basics of, say, Freudian thought. Indeed, Freud's emphasis on parent-child relations 
and the influence of family on child development greatly shaped much of the child-rearing advice that was popular during the 1920s and 1930s. In fact, he, his views were pretty popular until, I'd say, the 1960s or 1970s. So all this is my way of saying that it would be surprising to find out that the Wormsers were unaware of the major trends in child-rearing during the interwar years. Although Elaine's bedroom was equipped with electricity and central heating, I was struck by the absence of home electronics in her room. Phonographs and radios were invented in the late 19th century, and although early models were often large and ex expensive, smaller, cheaper units were being sold in the 1920s and 1930s. The lack of radio in Elaine's room is especially odd because this was the era, era when radio was king. When Sir it's like the internet now, basically, is what radio was in the 20s and 30s. This is when serialized episodes of shows like Little Orphan Annie and live jazz performances commanded audiences in the millions, especially among the younger set. Although home electronics items were much more likely to find a place in the teen bedroom after the Second World War, specifically the 50s, 60s, 70s, I would bet that some of Elaine's wealthy friends probably had radios or phonographs in their rooms. She was a bit of an outlier in this regard. <clears throat> On a related note, the Wormser bedroom doesn't seem to have been influenced much by other larger trends in popular culture. For instance, jazz, film, professional sports, etc. There didn't appear to be any pinups in a room, any do-it-yourself decorations that may have reflected her tastes or aspirations. Once again, these types of decorations were much more popular after the Second World War. But as I note in my book, during the 1920s and 30s, magazines aimed at America's youth started to recognize that some of the visual material in these publications often ended up on the walls of many teen bedrooms. Again, I would bet that some of Elaine's friends probably had at least a few pinups up in her room. Explaining why Elaine's bedroom was devoid of this type of material is fairly easy, however. This is because her bedroom was a super expensive artifact, really. I suspect that Elaine's parents Perhaps even Elaine herself wouldn't want to sully a work of art by sticking pinups of Clark Gable all over the place. Indeed, one could argue that Elaine's bedroom was a bit of a museum piece 90 years before it actually became a museum piece here in Cincinnati. <laughs> pinups and other found items just wouldn't have been a, a good fit for such a, a beautifully rendered space. Lastly, I want to draw attention to an aspect of the Wormser bedroom that neither the museum nor I can adequately assess without doing a lot more research. And this is Elaine's subjective experiences in her own room. The exhibit has done an excellent job uh, recreating the Wormser bedroom, and I hope I've done a good job explaining how several social forces helped make her bedroom possible. But I'm curious about some of the more subjective aspects of this bedroom. For instance, how it made Elaine feel when she was in it. In other words, I want to know the emotional impact this room had on Miss Wormser. Did she use it to escape from her parents whenever tensions arose between them? Did she spend hours in her room pining after one of her classmates or stewing, stewing over a perceived slight from one of her friends? What secrets did she keep in her room? Did she hide a forbidden piece of literature or even a pack of cigarettes underneath her bed? Did she, as one child development expert argued during the late 1920s, see her bedroom as, quote, a den in which the young animal of our species may crawl for freedom and protection from unwanted interferences from the adult in his environment, a sacred place in which the child for once is king, or in this case queen, of all he or she surveys? Fortunately, I can't answer many of these questions, but if Elaine's room was anything like the rooms of other American teens at this time, and as I've argued, I think it was, then I suspect that she may have seen it as a, as a world apart, a place where, to quote the Beach Boys and their 1963 hit song, In My Room, Elaine could engage in some dreaming, scheming, crying, and sighing in equal measure. So before I open up the floor to questions, I've got one more slide to share, which as you can see is nothing more than a shameless act of self-promotion. <laughs> there it is. Please buy my book. All right, uh, I think we're, oh, thank you.
We have time for a couple questions. Just please wait for the microphone. Hi. I was wondering if maybe the radio was built in to one of the case goods. I, was, I was gave thought to that, too, because I actually had a line in here that if this bedroom was built in the 50s, that Urban probably would have built like an actual piece of furniture that would house her records, house her radio, house her photographs. So that's definitely possible. It would definitely be the nicest, uh, nicest photograph radio cabinet ever, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? She's coming. Um, one of the things that I found kind of interesting about the design of the room, and, it, and this kind of plays into it being an absolutely huge space that she had to work with for her bedroom, is that it was um, described as being a place where she would sometimes entertain her friends with like a tea party setting. And I'm wondering if that kind of, I guess, hosting element to her bedroom is something that would maybe set her apart from being kind of like an upper class uh, youth or is, you know, I guess kind of like going to that question of was it something that she saw as a very private space? To me, that kind of reads it more as she's almost kind of like being prepared for that upper class kind of hosting mentality that we see or hear a lot about in, you know, that time period. Oh, most definitely. Um, I didn't really get into this, but uh, in my book I talk about how, especially for, for girls, the, the bedroom was seen as kind of a training ground for domesticity, a place where you would, you know, ha- have tea for your friends. But it was also for both uh, male and female, and I hinted at this earlier, it was a place to keep them off the streets. So it, it being a social center, that was entire, the, the parents were down with that because they knew, you know, even if they're, you know, getting up to no good in that bedroom, at least they knew that they weren't out on the streets creating trouble. So there's definitely that angle to it as well. There's a, there's a containment function to the, the teen bedroom that uh, you see it even in the 20s and 30s. After World War II, it intensifies with, you know, because the rise of the 60s counterculture, every parent thought that their, their teenagers would become drug addicts. So if they can entertain at home, all the better. So, yes. Hi, I'm so glad that you made it uh, through your harrowing aircraft experience and made it here to Cincinnati. Me too. Uh, yeah. um, I was just wondering if, uh, and I might have missed it, but was there any information to suggest that um, there was a relationship uh, with the family that um, he might have taken, an, Urban might have taken an interest in the child and that they were uh, friends and that this was a pet project of his? Um, I can't speak to that personally. I know that um, he, he, the, the, all the members of the family kind of gave their input into how the bedroom was designed, but I'm not sure if any kind of personal relationship was forged between Urban and even, even the father and the mother for that. Amy might uh, be able to better speak on that. But, uh, Prior to the, um, you know, its inception. And then my second thought was, did the, did the bed, like, suddenly open up and she slipped down into a very tacky room that had posters <laughs> all over the, uh, <laughs> the uh, walls some, below? Some sort of... Uh, time warp where she's all of a sudden thrown into a 1970s bedroom and uh, well, I, I, we were talking about this earlier because she got this bedroom when she was 17, 18 had it for two years and then went off to college and I was kind of wondering well what was her other bedroom like the one she had you know she would have had her own bedroom even back then it was, obviously it wouldn't have been a Joseph Urban design bedroom but I was kind of curious on what that would look like as well so, so I can address your question about um Warm, or the Wormser family and Joseph Urban and their relationship. Um, Elaine Wormser remembered as a, an older adult that her father may have met Joseph Urban while he was, um, w- while Urban was working on the renovation of the Central Park Casino, which was a restaurant, a very hot place to be in New York City. And um, thought that perhaps one of her father's clients was involved in that renovation project, and that's how they met. But they could have met any number of ways because they were really kind of circulating in the same social circles. Um, And the Ziegfeld Follies that um, Urban was designing the sets for, was traveling to Chicago. Um, So we don't quite know, but it definitely wasn't a pet 
project for him. Um, Leo Wormser, there was correspondence where Leo Wormser approaches um, Urban to design this room and invites him out to Chicago, and in fact has a buddy of his who is a colleague who also wants to do a redesign of his home. So Urban ends up doing these two projects, but it was just one of many, many projects because he was so prolific. And I want to think that she took the Clark Gable pictures down when the photographer came to take pictures. <laughs> I was just wondering if we know is the um, how Elaine felt about the room. It, to me, it looks more like something that her parents might be, um, you know, the conspicuous consumption and that kind of thing. Did she spend much time in the room? Do we have any uh, diary um, evidence or anything like that? Uh, any, anything like that that we might know? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good question because uh, well, part of the problem is that she didn't spend that many years of her life in the bedroom. She was like two years and then she was off to college. And, but uh, I believe Amy, you interviewed, or someone interviewed her. Yeah, there are several recorded interviews with her. Um, she didn't spend a lot of time there because she was at school in Massachusetts. Um, and she remembers saying she knew the room was important, but thinking back as an older person, she realized, wow, that was a really significant thing that I had. Um, <laughs> so I think maybe she didn't, she, she thought it was cool maybe, <laughs> but not as cool as it really is. Um, and I would have loved to have found her diaries, um, but as far as my knowledge. It's interesting as as though, know, it's interesting though, because maybe she just looked at it as just, well, this is just my bedroom. Right. You know, yeah, it's, it's it wasn't of... unusual for her, it was like, you know, any other teen bedroom except obviously not, but it was just, that was her space, you know. Well, it, the, the, if, depending on what she was using to hang up on the wall, it could do damage. Uh, I, think we have, the, I think we have time for one more question. So. I find it very unusual that this bed is up on a platform. It reminded me of, you know, the kings and queens of England that their beds are up on platforms. And I can't imagine getting out of bed and walking down <laughs> two steps to get to the main floor. Uh, it, it just doesn't seem realistic at all. Well, before, when I went up to see the exhibit with Amy, that was the first thing she told me was that th those stairs just seemed kind of odd. It's not the type of thing you'd actually walk down because they're like two and a half inches tall. So, it's definitely, uh, <laughs> yeah, probably. relates to my question, our observation, uh, it's a very sensual room uh, with a focus on the bed, whether it's Elizabethan or not, um, with, the, with the very sensual fabric everywhere, with mirrors everywhere, yeah. um, and the sensuality of the pieces of furniture, their shape the frankly phallic white uh, emblems on the, pieces, the <laughs> black pieces of furniture. Now we're going back to Freud again. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> but I would say there are a lot of elements that are extremely suggestive and quite far from some of the uh, issues you were talking about in, in bedrooms. Well, I didn't even notice this until I saw the exhibit and was pointed out to me by Amy or Emily, but the... Uh, the bedding on the, the the bedding on the bed, it looks like a corset. It's but again, this is this is kind of it's the 1920s, 1930s, the age of the flapper and the new woman. So maybe that's kind of a nod to that. But I, w I was struck by that as well. It's definitely uh, well, also particularly the lamps. Uh, there's a good deal of Orientalism, sort of like Valentino and the Sheik and that kind of thing. It's it's really. Uh, loaded with sexual imagery, it seems to me. <laughs> well, I think that that is a wonderful place to end that. <laughs> um, as we all turn a little bit. Right.
Right in the cheeks. Thank you, Jason, for joining us this evening. And thank you all for joining us and have a good evening.